I'm going to introduce Candy and then I'll um, turn it over to her. So Candy is a Wyoming ranch girl and lives still in Wyoming. She's written 16 books of Western history, um, one of which won a Spur Award from the Western Writers of America. And I'll speak a little bit more of that, that organization in a moment. Um, that biography is Chief Joseph, Guardian of the People. Um, she's also won a Spur Award for her film, In Pursuit of a Dream. She's produced award-winning films for museums and visitor centers across the West, including the Minuteman Missile um, Historic Site in South Dakota. And uh, she has written numerous magazine newspaper articles and lives in a wonderful small town where she does all kinds of things in Wyoming to keep the Western spirit going. Um, I want to point out a couple of things about her tenure that she just ended at the Western Writers of America. She was uh, the editor of Roundup Magazine for 17 years and then executive director for 11 years. She just retired. Western Writers of America just had their annual convention and Candy got to enjoy herself and not run around like a crazy person, though they kept calling on her. I watched that happen. <laughs> Candy, please help. <laughs> and she won a spur award then um, for her work as the writer for the documentary on the Battle of Red Buttes, 1865. I got to see a little teaser piece of that and it was fantastic. And so I can't wait to see the entire thing. So we just released Sacagawea, Mystery, Myth, and Legend, um, not long ago on, I think it was Ju June 22nd. And um, it's been getting a lot of attention ever since. And so I'm going to let Candy tell you all about her wonderful work on Sacagawea. So thank, thank you. you very much, um, Didra and, and the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation um, and, and Press for, first of all, publishing the book. And second of all, having me here tonight it is a pleasure. I'm going to apologize right up front. I started coughing this afternoon. And so I might have to take a drink of water here because if I get to coughing again, <laughs> hopefully that won't happen. So um, I'm going to bounce through a few slides. <clears throat> and there we go. And a little bit of information. And then I want to leave plenty of time at the end for some q and I love to just chat with people. So hopefully we can do that um, at the end of the presentation. Um, oh, whoops, just a minute. My, my screen just did a thing. There we go. <laughs> so when you write a biography of a person, you consider it or you try to make it a definitive account of a person's life. And in order to do that, you have to do your research. And depending on the on the individual that you're writing about, that research might happen um, if they happen to still be living, because that sometimes happens that you're working on a, a biography of a living person. You can talk with them, of course. But if they're deceased, which is the type of biography that I generally write, you go to the archival record, you try to find information about their their writings, their um, letters, anything that was written about them, but most importantly, anything that was written by them. So that in and of itself makes um, writing a book about our Indian woman today extremely challenging because there is absolutely nothing that is in the historical record that she wrote or that she is documented to have said herself. So we don't have her voice in anything, everything that's that's about her is written um, by other people, um, for the most part by men, um, especially in a contemporary view, the men who were with her. Um, and so that that makes the the challenge that's the first challenge in writing a biography about a woman like like our subject today. <clears throat> and oh, I have to make a note about my transitions. I did my PowerPoint and my 10 year old granddaughter decided it wasn't fancy enough. So she added all these transitions for me. So that would not be so good if I were doing it. Um, first thing about our, our subject is her name. And Didra says it differently than I do. <laughs> so I call her Sacagawea. There's um, a spelling with a J, which is the spelling that I use. And I'll explain in a minute why I did. There's a spelling with a G which is more the pronunciation that Deirdre uses. Um, and that's a, a spelling that is most often used by historians who are writing about her. 
Then there's the spelling with a couple of K's, Sakakawea. That's really common up in North Dakota. She's been called bird woman and boat pusher, grass woman. Uh, Clark, William Clark called her Janie. Sometimes he referred to her as the squaw. Um, so she's gone by a number of names and a number of spellings. I chose Sacagawea with the J because that is the spelling of her Limhai Shoshone band of Indians. And I went with the tribal spelling, not with the historian um, spelling. I just went with the tribal spelling. It was a, it was a, I had to make a choice and that's, that's what I did. So for me, it's Sacagawea. And then we try to figure out where's the truth of a person's life. And generally in a biography, you say where and when they were born, and then you end up in some manner with where and when they died. Well, in our case, we don't know precisely where or when she was born. We think most likely she was born in 1788 with the Limhi Shoshones out in um, Western or in Idaho, Northern Idaho, along the Bitterroots. Um, somewhere in the Salmon Salmon River area, which was one of their home camps. Um, we, we know that she died. We're not certain if she died in 1812 um, or if she died in 1884. So that's part of the mystery of her. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get down, down through here. So the first truth that we know about her is that she was a woman. And um, she started out as a young girl and she had a lot of things happen to her as a young girl. When she was about eight years old, she and her Limhi Shoshone um, family and other tribal members in their band, probably a small group, um, were camped on the three forks of the Missouri River in Montana. And their village was attacked. They were probably out hunting. And so it was a temporary village site. They were attacked. And in that attack, several people were killed. And a number of people, mainly young children, were taken captive. And they were they were marched east down the Missouri and ultimately to the Knife River, um, where she became a, a part of the village of the scattered lodges. Um, this was a Hadatsa village, and she she began to live with them. Um, as she was captured, there were there were several other young girls taken with her. One of them was a, a girl named Otter Woman, and Sacagawea and Otter Woman would spend most of their lives together. They they never separated, and the, but there were others who were with them, and one of them was a young girl who managed to escape. And she went by the name of, her Shoshone name was Nayanuki. She managed to escape from the captors and, and return to her Shoshone band. Um, and then, and there's a story about her um, that, that is quite compelling and um, certainly worth reading if you're, if you're interested in that whole era and story of those, those young girls being captured um, during that time frame. So, when um, Sacagawea, after she'd been captured, she started, she was living in the Hadatsa village. And this was quite different from what she had grown up with. As a young Shoshone, she had been in a band of people who were hunters and gatherers. They had camps and villages, but they were never really permanent. They moved a lot. They moved around. They followed game herds. They would go and, and hunt um, out on the buffalo plains out in Montana. They would also go into Idaho and along the rivers and fish for salmon. So they became known as the salmon eaters. And during all of that early, early seven or eight years of her life, when as soon as she was old enough to travel and, and walk with her mother, she began that process that, that all young Shoshone girls learned, which is how to identify plants um, that you could use and eat and and, and harvest for a variety of reasons. She began to learn how to take care of hides and process meat and just all the things that a young Shoshone girl would learn. So she she had that, and then she goes and she's living with Hadatsa, which is a completely different type of Indian culture. The Hadatsas, like the Mandans, were more um, sedentary. They lived in villages that didn't move. They had their earth lodges. They were large lodges, and mul multiple families would often live in the same lodge. They um, were farmers. 
They grew a lot of crops, most particularly corn and squash and beans that they traded with other tribes. The, the um, Hadatsa and Mandan village sites were very common trade sites. Um, people would would travel up up the route from coming out of the Southwest and they bring turquoise and silver and other commodities and they trade it for Buffalo meat and Buffalo robes and for corn. And so there was a lot of, a lot of back and forth trade. And so while she's living with the Hidatsa, she learns how to farm. She learns how to take care of crops and, and store things. Um, and, she had the advantage, though, of with Otter Woman being with her in the same village, in the same lodge, they were able to continue to speak their Shoshone language. So they retained that. And that was very important. And as her life progressed, she and um, Otter Woman were ultimately um, became a part of the family of Toussaint Charbonneau. Toussaint Charbonneau was a French Canadian fur trader. His family was from the Montreal area. And he um, he had had been in the fur trade. His father, his grandfather had both been in the fur trade as well. So it was a longstanding family tradition as fur traders. He had worked as a time he was at Fort Pembina. And then he came west and was on the upper Missouri. He was trading with the Mandans. He was trading with the Adatsa. And and he he had a wife who was native, and then he did some type of a trade, might have been a wager, it might have been some kind of a, a gambling game. But at any rate, he came into possession, and I use the term possession specifically because he really did come to possess both Sacagawea and Otter Woman. And then he ultimately, they became his wives, and he had at least those three wives initially, and later he had other wives. So he was, in many respects, he was um, following the traditions of fur traders who would marry or um, take as wives young Indian women who were from powerful families quite often. And they did that as a, as a way to broker um, deals and trades. It gave power to him and it gave power to the tribal leader as well, because they could, would then have a market for their furs. So she came a part of um, Toussaint's family and they were living um, at the, at the Adatsa village when Lewis and Clark came up the river in 1804. And they they came through South Dakota, and most many of you probably know that they had a little altercation in South Dakota near Fort Pier, present day Fort Pier, with the Teton Sioux. It became quite hostile. No one was injured or killed, but it very well could have been the end of the Lewis and Clark expedition had they not extracted themselves from, from the conflict there. And one thing that happened as a result of that is Lewis and Clark realized that they needed to have translators. They needed to be able to better understand and work with the native people. Part of their task in their job of exploring the um, Louisiana Purchase was to learn about the tribes. And, and it's pretty hard to learn about someone's culture if you can't communicate with them. So they decided that they they needed some translators and they hired they hired a translator um, who was working with them by the time they got to Fort Mandan. But then once they reached the site where they built Fort Mandan, Toussaint Charbonneau always had his ear to the ground. He always knew what was going on. And he showed up and he came with a deal. He said he would like to become their translator. And not only that, that he would be able to translate with to French and English, and he could um, speak a little bit of Hidatsa, but most importantly, he had these two Indian wives who were both Shoshone, and he could speak with them. He could, through their Hidatsa connection, they could they could communicate. He didn't speak Shoshone, and they didn't speak French, but they both they all three had enough Hidatsa that they could actually communicate. And so he told Lewis and Clark, "You should hire me because I'll bring these two women. They are Shoshone." You're going to need to negotiate with the Shoshones for horses in order to get across the bitter roots. And Lewis and Clark agreed to that. And the three of them, Hadats, or uh, excuse me, Toussaint and Sacagawea and Otter Woman moved in to Fort Mandan for the winter. And in February, 
Sacagawea, who was about 16 years old, gave birth to her son, Jean Baptiste. Um, it was a very difficult birth um, by all of the accounts that we that we have, mainly from Lewis and Clark and their journals. Um, and and Lewis aided her greatly in in the delivery of the baby. Uh, just before they were ready to leave and start up the river um, to continue their journey in the spring of 1805, Toussaint had a bit of a temper and he got into a, he started pushing and shoving with Lewis and Clark. He wanted them to give him more than they had offered. And he just, he just was making some demands and they weren't giving into his demands. And so he took Sacagawea and Otter Woman and they left, they moved out of the fort and about three days later, he decided, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. And they came back and then they joined the um, expedition as they started up the river. When they left um, the village and started up the river that spring, Otter Woman did not go with them. And it's not real clear why, but the my speculation is that they took Sacagawea because she did have the baby and that would be a real signal to anyone that they met along the trail that they were a peaceful group. Um, it, it's known that that women were sometimes warriors and they would travel with a, a war party or a party of men and they would engage in battle. Um, but women with babies and children didn't do that. So uh, that's my speculation. I can't prove it in any way, really. Um, but I think that's why Sacagawea went. I think the reason that that they didn't take both Otter Woman and Sacagawea might be as simple as they didn't want to have to provide for another mouth to feed. They didn't want to have to worry about another woman. They'd had during the course of the winter, there'd been a number of situations that developed um, at Fort Mandan between the men of the expedition and some of the Indian men and the Indian women. And it, it was you know, there, there just been conflict. And I think maybe they also wanted to just avoid that. So one woman, that's it. You're not going to have two. And then that they're just going to move on. And so Sacagawea's role with the core of discovery really was to be a mother and travel with her son and her husband, and also to be a translator once they reached the Shoshone's. Um, she they obviously traveled all the way up the Missouri. They made it to the three forks um, of the Missouri. And when they got there, she really recognized the country. She knew that was where she had been taken captive about eight years earlier. She she talked about that. Um, that's clear from the from the historical record that she told Lewis and Clark this is where she'd been taken captive. She told them the exact place where where she'd been taken captive. And Lewis wrote about it and he said that she showed absolutely no emotion um, to the fact that she'd been taken captive and that this is where basically some bad things had happened to her and her family. Um, but she may have had all types of emotion. Um, she just may have suppressed it. She may not have in any way shown it to the men. Um, she, she also might've just been a woman that had to adapt I mean, it, just as she had to adapt from Shoshone life and living style to Hadatsa. Now she's traveling with a group of men and she just may not, she just may not have expressed anything directly to them. We don't know what she felt. That's where it'd be really great to have some of her voice and some of her recollections in her story. They traveled then they went on West and the next real landmark that she recognized was Beaverhead Rock which is in Western Montana. She knew exactly where she was, even though she hadn't been there since she was eight years old. When, when you're uh, living in a, a culture where you travel and, and you, you walk for the most part, or maybe ride a horse, you really see and know and understand landmarks. And so she, she could recognize the country by the landmarks. Um, by that time, Lewis and Clark had separated a bit, and Clark was with the boats in Sacagawea and Toussaint, um, and Lewis was ahead with three men uh, looking. They knew that, that the Shoshones were nearby because they'd seen plenty of evidence, and he was watching for Shoshones, trying to meet up with them. He ultimately did. He managed to communicate a little bit, um, even though he had no real translator with him. Um, he was 
able to make the Shoshones um, understand that he wanted to trade with them and that there were others on the trail coming up and that if they could get together, they could have a better conversation. And so they all joined together in Horse Prairie um, and in Western Montana. And that is where all these fancy transitions. That is where Sacagawea um, actually really stepped. I say she stepped right, right out, out of the, the back shadows and right into the forefront of history. They had a conference between nations, the United States and the Shoshones and Sacagawea became the translator. And she had, as soon as they met the Shoshone group, she had reconnected with Nayanuki, the young girl who had been um, captured with her many years before. And she she knew other people in the tribe. They went in, they they set up an arbor and they sat down to begin the translation. And when she sat down and she looked up at the man that she was to translate to, it was none other than her brother Kamiya Um, Probably the most amazing thing in all of Western history that that, that would be the case. Um, but it was him, and and there's um, really good description of their reunion in the journals, the Lewis and Clark journals, um, by all all of the journals wrote about it, and how affected she was, and she cried, and she threw her blanket over herself and her brother, and they hugged and they cried, and they really had a, a private reunion right in the midst of this this conference that they're going to have this this. Um, to determine whether they get horses. And even the men, Lewis and Clark both wrote about it, that even the men of the expedition were quite affected by her and how emotional she was there. Um, so it might have been that she didn't show any emotion at the point where she was captured, but when she's suddenly face to face with a family member, it just all hit her. At any rate, she settled down and they began the negotiations. Every once in a while, she'd break down in tears and it would slow down, but they ultimately were able to negotiate for the horses. And I think this is probably the, the single most important thing that she did on the expedition. If they didn't get horses, they couldn't get over the bitter route. They all knew that. And she was able to convince her brother and her other family members who were in that tribal band to give up horses that they themselves needed for their own survival. They needed them to be able to travel, to move their villages, to go hunting. And she was able to convince them um, through the translation chain that they should give these horses to the expedition. And ultimately they, um, they did get the horses. They traveled through the bitter roots. It was a really rough time, a lot of snow, cold. They met with the Nez Perce. They ultimately, and I'm zipping through here, but they ultimately made it down to the um, Columbia, the mouth of the Columbia River. They were on the Washington side, so north of the river when they got there. One of, in addition to getting the horses and negotiating for the horses, the other really, really significant thing that Sacagawea did, which, which was really typical of of a any Shoshone woman, was that they always worked for quote, the tribe or the village for the people. They they always worked for what would be best for everyone. They didn't work for what would be best for me individually. That's just not, that wasn't their culture. And so she, all along the way, she traveled and she gathered food and she shared that food with, with all of the tribal members. She, she dug roots and berries. She gathered berries. She found all kinds of just native plants that could add to their diet. If she hadn't done that, they would have been eating primarily meat. And that's not real good for your system if all you eat is meat. Once they got to the Columbia River, it was it was late in the fall and it was cold, wet, rainy, pretty miserable actually. And they decided the the captains decided that they needed to build a more permanent type of a place where they could stay similar to Fort Mandan from the prior year. And they decided that they would have a vote as to the location of their, of their fort for the winter that year. And in that vote, they allowed all the members of the expedition to vote, including Clark's slave York and Sacagawea. Um, later in many, many years later, 
people would write about Sacagawea that that was so significant that she was the first woman in America to vote. Um, and it was a, a thing about equal equality. Um, there, it was they she became a symbol of woman suffrage when in reality, if you if you know anything about tribal relations, Indian women in some tribes, not all tribes, but Indian women in some tribes had always had a vote. In in many tribes, they're matrilineal. And the women were actually the leaders and they made the decisions and the men followed along. So for an Indian woman to have a vote and have a say, particularly a say in where you're going to establish a camp was not unusual. And that was certainly not unusual for the Shoshones. The women were always the ones who established the camps. Um, the men would, of course, they decide where they were going to establish that camp based on resources that were nearby. The other thing that happened in that way, so they voted, let me back up, they voted to go to um, south of the Columbia River into the Oregon, what's now the Oregon side, and they established Fort Clatsop, where they did spend the winter. And it was wet, it was rainy, it was dreary. Um, they had a hard time finding enough food, the elk were pretty plentiful initially, and then they became pretty sparse. Um, but they did a lot of trading that winter and a lot of um, meetings with the local tribes. And in one of the one of the kind of significant tri trades, and obviously the one artifact that everybody in Western history would love to see, <laughs> they the one of the tribal people came in and they had some beautiful sea otter um, pelts, and Lewis really wanted one of those pelts and they tried to trade for it and nothing that they had was going to make the trade. They just, they didn't have very many trade goods left by that time. So their, their, their stock was just so low. And ultimately what they did is he took a blue beaded belt that Sacagawea was hers, that she wore, she had made it. And they traded that belt for the sea otter pelts. They, um, they later gave her a piece of blue cloth in exchange for the belt. So they quote, technically paid for her belt, but they didn't give her a choice of whether or not they were going to use it, which might have been an indication that once again, whatever was right for the good of the expedition is what they would do and how they would do it. Um, I'm, I'm sure anybody would love to see any piece or part of that blue beaded belt. It is probably somewhere in a in a tribal burial or um, something out in the Pacific Northwest. Probably never find it, but it certainly would be a a great thing to to locate at some point. The blue beads were significant because they were the type of beads that everyone really prized. All the tribes prized the blue beads and they didn't have any more blue beads to um to trade so once they gave away that belt they didn't have anything else that was of real significance uh oh just a minute my uh oh there we go um so then they they turn around in the spring of 186 and they were very relieved to leave Fort Clatsop and leave all the rain and all the mud and all the dreariness behind them. And they started they started back along their trail, back um, on their journey back to Fort, um, well, the Hidatsa village in Fort Mandan. And on the on the journey back, they decided when they got into the um, the Bitterroot, as they crossed the Bitterroot, they had to spend about a month with the Nez Perce because they were too early in the spring um, and they couldn't get across the mountains because there was too much snow. So they they spent quite a lot of time with the Nez Perce um, on their homeward journey as they had on their outbound journey. And then when they came down in to where what is now kind of basically Lolo, Montana, um, in a place in the Lewis and Clark um, locations known as Traveler's Rest, in that general area, they split and Lewis went to the east and he wanted to go and he wanted to go up the Marias River that they had seen the year before, which is east of Great Falls, Montana. And Clark wanted to go back down the Missouri the way they had traveled on when they were coming west. But then he wanted to cross down and he wanted to um, follow the Yellowstone River, which they had also um, 
cross when they came upstream, they came, they saw the confluence of the Yellowstone. So he knew that was a fairly significant river and he wanted to go that way. So Sacagawea, Toussaint and Jean Baptiste all traveled with Clark and he had a small group of men who were with him. Um, and they went down and they ultimately got down to the area near today's Bozeman, Montana. And there Sacagawea really became a guide for him. And she directed him to the pass that they needed to cross in order to reach the Yellowstone. An indication that as a young girl, she had traveled that route, had probably been going buffalo hunting with her with her tribal band. And they we know that they hunted at times in the Yellowstone area and certainly along the Yellowstone in southern Montana. And so she guided him through over the pass, which would now be you'd know it now as Bozeman Pass. And then they dropped down onto the Yellowstone where they built some dugout boats and they got on the river and they just made lickety split time going down river. They're going with the current. It's spring, the water's high. Um, so they could travel really fairly quickly. And when they got down to, uh, they came to a big outcrop, uh, natural outcrop and, there at a place, and we know it today as Pompey's Pillar, it was named for Sacagawea's young son, um, Jean Baptiste, who um, the men called Pomp or Pompey. Um, they also called, um, Clark also called him my little dancing boy. He was very close to the little boy who by then was about 18 months old. And so he was walking and he was, you know, probably like any toddler into things. And they at this um, rock outcrop, there is one piece of physical evidence from the Lewis and Clark expedition, and it is an inscription that William Clark scratched into that sandstone outcrop with his name. And it's now protected. It's now a national monument. Um, and so it, it is the only tangible of the entire trip along along their journey. They um, they returned, they met back up with Lewis and, and his group, and they all got back to the area of the Hidatsa and Mandan villages. And there, there was, um, the journey was over. And Toussaint, who obviously liked the money that he'd been making, um, that he at least been promised um, in traveling with them, was wanted to continue on downriver. Um, to St. Louis with Lewis and Clark, but he couldn't convince any of the Hadatsa leaders to go with him. And when he didn't have anybody that he needed to translate for, there was really no purpose in him going. Um, he was ultimately paid $420 for his service and Sacagawea was not given anything. Um, she was barely given a thank you, except by Clark, who did did say that she deserved more than than they were able to give her. And it was partially because they were a, a, a government expedition. They had the authority to do certain things, but not to do other things. But the one um, lasting thing that Clark did is he had really formed a close bond with Sacagawea and with Jean Baptiste. And he told Toussaint and Sacagawea that he wanted to take the boy and when he was older and take him to St. Louis and raise him and educate him and give him a better opportunity. It's uh, It was a practice that was common. In fact, Lewis also took a young um, Indian boy with him after the after the journey, and he, he, he had for a time a young Indian boy with him. Um, so it wasn't an uncommon thing for that to happen. So Sacagawea returned to the Adatsa village. She returned to Otter Woman. They went back into their their lifestyle of living and raising raising crops and taking care of the children and just um, having their lives for about five years. And then she and um, John Baptiste, excuse me, she and John Baptiste and Toussaint did go downriver to St. Louis. They met with Clark. They they lived there for uh, about eighteen months and. They had a farm at a time that um, was something that Clark had had helped arrange so that um, Toussaint would have a way to make a living. But making a living as a farming really didn't fit with Toussaint Charbonneau's um, 
mindset. He was a wanderer and an explorer, and he didn't really like having to do the farming work. And Sacagawea was certainly not happy and not healthy down there. And so they left um, and they went back up the river. They left um, Jean Baptiste with Clark. They went back up the river and um, back into North, well, through South Dakota and into North Dakota. In the summer, in August of 1812, she gave birth to another child, uh, a girl named Lizette. Um, we don't know a lot about her. Um, we know that she was probably with Sacagawea um, in that, that winter at Fort Manuel. And that is where, on December 20th, 1812, a, a Shoshone Indian woman who was a wife of Charbonneau um, died. And it was, she, it was written that she was about 25 years old and she was the best woman at the fort. The fort factor wrote that, a guy named John Luddig wrote that note, but he unfortunately didn't use her name. And so there has been, since that time, there has been the, um, common, commonly accepted understanding by a lot of people, including most historians, that that woman was Sacagawea. And the, the baby Lizette was taken down the river um, by Luddick and was turned over to um, William Clark, who became her guardian the, fo um, the following year. And then she just, that little baby just completely disappears from the record. So most likely died as an infant. Um, there's just really nothing more about her. So that could be the end of the story for Sacagawea, that, that she died in December of 1812. However, there's always another little story, and that's what makes history so fun. Um, years later, there was a book that was researched and written by a Wyoming historian, Grace Raymond Hebert, um, who was quite honestly, quite revered in Wyoming as a, as a prominent um, historian. She began researching the Sacagawea story, and she wrote a book that was published in 1830, 18, wrong century, 1932, by the Arthur H. Clark Company um, called Sacagawea. And in her book, she says and, and makes um, a strong argument that Sacagawea did not die um, in 1812, but that she did leave Charbonneau around that time. She traveled south and she um, connected with Comanches who would have been relatives um, to the Shoshones. And she lived with them, that she married, she had more children. And ultimately she made her way back to the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming and joined with Chief Washakie's band. There's um, a number of of tribal Wind River residents that, um, so Eastern Shoshone residents that she has documentation from, letters and journals and, and all kinds of notes that she collected, um, including from Washakie's son, John Washakie, that Sacagawea was there by 1868 when the um, Eastern Shoshone's negotiated their treaty at Fort Bridger that gave them the Wind River Reservation um, in central Wyoming. And then that she died in 1884, uh, April 9th, 1884, and is buried in the Washakie Cemetery, just west of Fort Washakie, Wyoming. There's a marker to her there. There's a marker there to a, a boy named Basil, a young man by that time named Basil, who was um, the daughter of her, or excuse me, the son of her sister, whom she had adopted when she went with Lewis and Clark. Um, she adopted that boy. And there's not really a direct line as to how and when they reconnected, if it was before, at any time before they were on the Wind River Reservation. Um, but the tribal members today on the Wind River Reservation will tell you that Sacagawea died there and she's buried there. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what they said. Um, so that's part of the mystery of Sacagawea. Um, her legacy is, is very strong. Obviously, she's one of the most recognized um, women in all of American history. She's been um, venerated in paintings and sculptures and all kinds of artwork, um, including the coin, the, the 
image that's on the cover of my book, which you see it here as well, was a drawing that was done by Glenna Goodacre, uh, an artist, and it was the drawing that was used for the Sacagawea coin when it was developed. The, uh, the model for the, the drawing was a woman who is Eastern Shoshone. She is not Limhi band, um, but she is in that, that culture. She would be, have been, been considered a cousin of Sacagawea. Um, and so that um, kind of concludes what I wanted to talk about. And now I'll, um, I'm going to stop my share here and then I can take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Candy. How fascinating. So many threads to this story. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask people to write in the chat their questions because we have 40 participants. And I'm trying to open my chat up. And in the meantime, maybe while people are, are getting their fingers going for typing, maybe you could tell us um, if there's Something in particular when you were doing your research that really surprised you? Well, <laughs> I can tell you the one thing that I, I added at the very end of the book was part of this information about Grace Raymond Hebert, um, because th the book that she wrote is pretty hefty, and, and Arthur H. Clarke is a pretty respected, I mean, a very respected publisher, and so all they've done the whole the whole history of the Arthur H. Clark Company is these really solidly researched historical books. And I was actually um having a drink <laughs> with Bob Clark um one day about a year ago. And he made this kind of just oblique comment. He knew I was working on this book and he made an oblique comment about, well, yeah, well, but but Grace paid for that book's publication. And I'm like, what? She paid for it. I mean, I didn't know Arthur H. Clarke was ever uh, what you would call a vanity or a subsidy press. And he said he always he said that. And then he said, well, yeah, it was during the 30s and we had no money. The, the press was about to go under and it was the only way we could keep things going. So I that just piqued my interest. And so I'm only 70 miles away from the um Hebert Research Center and Re Research Library at the University of Wyoming at the American Heritage Center, where they have all of her papers and her, her whole collection. And so I made a trip to Laramie and I dug into her boxes of archival materials and all of her letters and all of her correspondence regarding the writing and publishing of Sacagawea. And I found in that a letter of receipt from Arthur H. Clark to Grace Raymond Hebert for $1,000 as a partial payment for the publication of Sacagawea. So uh, that surprised me. I, it, and on a lot of levels, that surprised <laughs> me. Um, and I, I documented, I put it in a footnote. It's kind of, it's an afterthought, but I just think it's really fascinating that she, quote, rewrote the end of Sacagawea's story and it was, she was doing a lot of this work. This is a connection to that woman's suffrage story. They were trying to get the, um, what is it, the 19th Amendment passed. Now, Wyoming already had suffrage because we started voting here in 1868. So we didn't have to worry about what everybody else was doing. But Hebert was very involved in that national movement for national suffrage. And um so that was that was fascinating to me. I actually want to dig a little bit deeper into that that whole idea. Sac uh, Rim Raymond um, also, or Grace Raymond Hebert also wrote a history of Washakie in the same time frame, a couple of years after she did the Sacagawea book. And I, I'm now so intrigued by this that I want to go dig through the Washakie papers and see if she paid for the publication of that one as well. Um, it, it's just fascinating. There were, there was, if you're interested in publishing, it was really fascinating because there were all these letters, um, that she and, and Arthur H. Clarke were writing. They were clearly close, close. I mean, they were editor and publisher or editor, publisher, and writer. 
but they were friends. You could just tell they were pretty honest in their communication. And, and he was writing a lot about all the challenges for publishing in that time frame. Nobody was buying books. Libraries weren't buying books. Right. People weren't buying books. No one was buying books. And he's just trying to survive, you know, put food on his table and keep his company going. So it, I think it's it's a fascinating story. There's probably some journal article in that somewhere. I don't know what that is. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. All right, we've got some great questions that are showing up in the chat. Um, so the first one is, why did, now I'm, I'm self-conscious now about how I'm going to say Sakajalaya, <laughs> why did she not join her brother or her people when they met up with Lewis and Clark or after the course task was completed? I, I can't really answer that, except I'll say this. She was married to Toussaint Charbonneau. And as an Indian woman in that time, she would go where her husband went. And even though she may, they when they returned, when Lewis and Clark returned um, from Fort Clatsop and, and were heading east again, they did not encounter the Shoshones as they came back through that Bitterroot, um, Western Montana country. So first of all, they never, they never connected. So she didn't even really have to make a decision. But beyond that, I think she stayed with Charbonneau because she considered herself to be his, his wife. That makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. The next question is, did she ride horses in the expedition? How much did she walk in? Uh, did, was she carrying pomp on her back? Yeah. All the time? Okay. So there's a whole lot in that question. So when they traveled West, for the most part, she she rode in the boat with Pomp, and she did have a carrier for him that she carried him on. Um, and she was in the boat, I think, as much as, as she would allow herself to be. She clearly liked to walk. And Clark and Lewis took turns walking. One would walk one day, one would walk the next day kind of thing along uh, with the boats. And so she became, I think that's why she became so close to Clark. She and Toussaint would often walk with Clark and York. And so she did do a lot of walking on the journey West. Once they got horses, yes, she had a horse and she carried Pomp. She, the carrier that she carried Pomp in, she actually lost. They, they, Clark and um, Charbonneau and Sacagawea and Pomp, the baby, were, um, got caught in a flash flood up near Great Falls. And they lost a lot of things, including the carrier that she'd been carrying the baby in. She probably made something else, some type of a sling or something to carry him in. And then she did ride horseback. And on the, the return journey, they traded a lot for horses. They started out by boat up the um, coming up the Columbia River. And then when they got a little farther up the river, they started trading for horses. And um, Charbonneau actually traded for horses for her. So they definitely got a horse for her. And as a Shoshone woman, she would, you know, even as a child, she would have ridden horses a lot. So that would have been pretty common with her. So next question wants to probe that relationship with Clark and Lewis a little bit further. Were either of those men in love with her? Well, definitely Lewis was not. <laughs> I, think, I, I don't think there was any, any uh, romantic connection whatsoever with Lewis. I think there was a really strong bond with her and Clark. I don't know if it was love. Uh, I don't think there was anything romantic. I just don't think that ever happened. I don't know how it even could have happened. They stayed in the same lodge always. So Lewis and Clark and York, Sacagawea and um, Pomp and Toussaint and the interpreters, they all shared a lodge. They shared shared, you know, when they were traveling, they shared their things. So she was with those guys all the time. Most likely they kept her near them for her own protection so that none of the other men got any kind of wild ideas. You know, there's a bunch of guys out there with no women. So they, well, Indian women along the way, certainly there was a lot of Indian women, um, Corps of Expedition relations going on along the route. There's no question about that. I do not write a lot about that in the book. I allude to it a little bit. And I kind of did that intentionally. I hope that young people read this book and I didn't think we needed to go there. So that was kind of intentional on my part. Okay, so back to the question about um, the possibilities of Sakajawea's death or death much later. And is there one that you lean toward? 
I, I, <laughs> I really don't have a firm opinion. And that sounds really weird, except that I have this nagging thing in the back of my head that, and I kind of want to dig into it. The woman who died in 1812, we know that that Otter Woman and Sacagawea were together at that time. And we know that that Toussaint was there. Um, and I just had this nagging thing that was it Otter Woman who died? Was it not Sacagawea? And I actually, there's a whole alternate. I didn't I didn't talk about this. There's a whole alternate story that the Adatsa have. That Sacagawea was Hadatsa and not Shoshone. I'm not going into all of that. But the, I asked, I have a friend who's Adatsa, and I asked her the question about Otter Woman. I said, well, what's the Adatsa story about Otter Woman? She said, well, she died in 1812. So that's their story. And I, I don't know. So I, I tend to think maybe she lived beyond 1812, but I can't prove it. Maybe someday you'll find some oh boy cache of yeah. documents. Right, this is every historian's dream, right? To it find is. It is treasure trove no one else has seen, right? Yeah. the The blue belt, the blue belt, and the and some other letter or document that proves who died. Yeah, we so would if all love that. Out there, have that. You need to tell us. <laughs> I will. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. You're hiding right. that. You're covered. <laughs> So how did you decide to write this book and choose Sakajue as your topic? And how long did it take? And what, what's your daily process? There are a lot of questions in there. Um, well, I I was convinced by the, the former editor. And, and the <laughs> My predecessor. Of, the, of South, yes, your predecessor. I was convinced by Nancy and Chuck Rankin to write this book. It took a lot of convincing. Um, not because I didn't like the topic and not because I didn't think I could do a good job with it, but because I knew the challenges of how do you write a book about a person and you have not one word of what that person said, thought, felt, or otherwise. So it, it took them a while, like I'm talking a couple of years to convince me to write it. And, and finally I agreed. And then I I don't remember how many years ago that was, but it was several. I was doing <laughs> things like running Western writers and making films. And so um, that's what I did. My daily process when I'm writing a book, I try to do all the research first for the most part. And then when I start writing, I just sit down and write. And I work eight hours a day or 12 or 14, whatever whatever my role is. <laughs> Maybe it's three, but I just I work every day. But I don't work on writing a book all day, every day. I have a lot of other jobs that I do, which is the best part of my of my work that I get to bounce around from things. So but when I when I finally got to writing this, I actually just well, when I retired from Western Writers last year, I really got serious about it. And I sit down and said, let's finish this book and get it done. And we did. And it's glorious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, the last thing I can see on my screen, so I always hope that my chat is not missing people. Um, John Fisher likes, wants to talk about, and he's right below me in, in my vision of, <laughs> of all of you out there, um, to think about this question about the vote. Um, and so he says, the vote was an opinion survey, like what was done downstream when deciding which way to go. Like that question about, should they take the Marias path or not? Um, Right, I think that's what he's referring to. Officers seek information ideas. They do not act on votes. The actual journal entries say consultation, as I recollect. They went against the opinion on which way to go downstream, but decided to go with the opinion of the majority at the Pacific. And is, is I guess, do you agree with that? Well, kind of sort of yes and no. Okay, so yeah, it was an opinion. It was an opinion poll. How, how do you think we ought to do? What do you think we ought to do? But they recorded them. I mean, it wasn't like a straw vote, like, okay, let's all raise our hands and, and that's the end of it. They actually re recorded it. Who vote, quote, voted how, or my opinion is this or that. So it's recorded and it's by name and by sometimes a comment like the Sacagawea. It's a comment that she voted to go south of the river because she knew she could find potatoes there. How did she know that? She had no doubt been in conversation somehow with Indian women that they were trading with so that she knew, hey, go there. It's it's better. 
And if you've ever been to the confluence of the um, Columbia, the north side, Washington is kind of rocky and it's it doesn't seem real fertile, honestly. And then you go south and down around um, Astoria and where Fort Clatsop was and it's lush, it's, you know, there's a lot of vegetation. So you can see why people might have said, well, go south of the river. There's more food there. So, yeah, but but there it's actually recorded. I mean, it's each individual person's name and how they vote. I say they voted. I mean, might have been an opinion, but the the captains recorded it. Yeah, so the amount of writing that took place on this expedition I mean, was kind of astounding. I'd say so we know you use Lewis and Clark's journals. Who else? Had um, uh, well, I use papers I used, available for you to use. Yeah, Ordway and Shields. I mean, all uh, there were about five journals from that were contemporary to the expedition. Lewis and Clark were the best. Shields had a good one. Ordway's is really good because they they wrote things that you know it was more from a, a man's perspective of just I'm. Um, here doing the job kind of thing. And so they had different observations. And so I, I relied on Lewis and Clark. They're the official journals. Um, and the, and there are varying, um, uh, editions of that. I went with the uh, Gary Moulton for the most part, um, knowing that it's the most scholarly, the most detailed has the best footnotes um, in it. And by the way, I'm not related to Gary Moulton. We just happen to have the same last name. Um, but um, I did rely on his, but then I used the others to supplement and to add what I call the color of the story. So Ordway and Shields particularly. So one of the things that, that having no sources from the actual topic, <laughs> or your figure, your central figure, uh, must have meant that you, you had to, to read between the lines of those yeah, journals to kind of find her. You did. Um, th They wrote about her, you know, they didn't, they wrote about her more than you actually think, it, but it's little teeny tiny snippet here and a little snippet there. And so you just kind of had to pull it out. And then you just had to kind of put, usually it was both Clark and Lewis. And so you could put their true to perspectives together and kind of like anything you want that third you'd like to have that third one so you got three people that sort of agree with something that happened um but you didn't always have that i mean the 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 descriptions of when they were going upstream and they capsized the boat and she saved the papers um some really important papers the journals i mean heavens she salvaged half of the expedition record right there in that one fell swoop and then they named they named a river after her like two days later so they obviously recognized her contribution there and and there was another situation right in that same time frame is before they got to great falls where she was very very ill and they thought she was going to die and there's some really poignant stuff that they write about her and you really see in that writing how much both lewis and clark cared for her as a person and also valued her that like, we can't lose her. We lose her. We kind of lose our expedition because how are we ever going to get the horses? You know, they don't say that, but that's the underlying current that we've got to save her for that. I think by then though, Clark was particularly, um, he was protective of her. There is no question. He was protective of her when um, they were out near Beaverhead Rock and Toussaint Charbonneau struck her one day. Clark really basically got after him and um, he, he, he was very protective. He cared about her. There's no question he cared about her a lot. Well, that is a great place to kind of wrap this all up. It